So hello and welcome everyone to Chloe JLD's second event for Mental Health Awareness Week. As you all know, Donna Smith was going to deliver a session on burnout for us today, but unfortunately she's tested positive for COVID, so couldn't join us. To the rescue is the brilliant Susie Stanley. Susie is a consultant property litigator, a mediator, a life coach and author of best-selling book, Your Life in Your Control. I'd say that's a pretty impressive resume. Um, unfortunately, Susie will need to drop off um, about 20 past one um, because she's got a client meeting and needs to rescue her daughter who's <laughs> hay fever. So um, <laughs> I'm sure that'll be okay. But um, before that, Susie will be giving us a talk on loneliness, which is the theme of this year's Mental Health Awareness Week. We will then have some breakout session networking to discuss your own experience of, of loneliness and coping strategies that you've developed. We'll then come back into the main room where I'll give a talk about my own experiences and tips that I have learned to help alleviate loneliness. So without further ado, over to you, Susie. Thanks, Sonne. Um, uh, yes, I do apologize. I'm gonna to have to drop off, but uh, having just had a phone call from my school, I feel I better go and rescue my daughter as soon as possible. Anyway, so yes, loneliness. Um, now when I first gave this speech, the, the first thing um, I was told was, please don't make anyone sad. Um, I, I'm not about to make you sad. Um, in actual fact, it, it's, it's a strange topic, loneliness, but I think it's something that we need to be aware of rather than sit there thinking, I'm lonely. Um, the chances are we've all experienced loneliness, um, but I think we probably all have coped with it. But this is just going to be, uh, I suppose, a roundup of what it looks like and how we can cure it. And basically, the, the curing is what you're doing now is joining sessions and making it making yourselves aware that it exists but also that there are other people who are also suffering perhaps but there's people you can talk to so loneliness so at the heart of loneliness is a lack of connection um so real human connection allow us to relate to others um feel supported and validated by others and this is part of what we need as human beings we need to have ourselves validated or we need to feel supported we can't just do everything in a vacuum we need to share our struggles. We need to share our victories. We want somebody to say, well done. We don't just want to sit there going, huh, I did that. That's a bit hollow after you've had a really good victory. So we want to be able to share things. And we want to share them with people who understand us the best and who better than fellow lawyers. Um, and without that authentic connection, we kind of feel that distance from others, a lack of trust, um, and a growing sense that we're on our own and the isolation and the loneliness begins. Now, law care, and I think Sonia will probably have mentioned law care too many times, um, they describe that a connection exists between people when they feel seen, heard and valued, when they can give and receive without judgment, when they derive a sustenance and strength from that relationship. So it's kind of face to face. Now, during the pandemic, of course, you've had to rely on increased use of IT. And whilst that's been great, we've learned to use Zoom, we've learned to use Teams, it's brought people virtually closer, but it's really reduced the opportunity for face-to-face -face communication. And that's highlighted what they call a psychological loneliness. It's all up here, but it's not. You still feel alone, or that, but it's, it's been drawn out by this IT use. There's no screen interaction that will ever equal the connection that can you, you can make in real time face to face connection. So a common issue amongst us lawyers is that we serve people at their real vulnerable times, people divorcing, people buying a new house, really stressful times, litigation, really stressful. Even for us lawyers, it's stressful. So you can only imagine people who don't understand that we have to jump through various hoops. They get super stressed, corporate deals, um, other property negotiations. These are all really stressful times and clients are scared, they're worried, they're stressed. And they pass that on to us, they tell us these things and we harbor it. And that can affect us. Now this is called vicarious trauma. And it does affect us probably more than we actually think. And it's a whole new, topic and I know law care do a load of things about this vicarious trauma but we can deal with that but as lawyers we're not the best at practicing self-care um, and we tend to keep those bits of information and the struggles and the frustrations we feel from that information to ourselves and we create more distance by doing that so 
if you start to push people away because you feel that you shouldn't express the fact that you're feeling frustrated or you're struggling because of some sense of perfectionism, I guess, you're actually isolating yourself more by pushing people away. If you think about that, that's absolutely nuts because people you're pushing away have probably been there, done that, got the T-shirt and know that what you should be doing is just telling somebody that this is really getting too much. The client is really stressed and it's passing down to you. So you've got to learn to open up. And that leads me on to the cure for loneliness. And my little buzz phrase for all of this is stay connected in a disconnected world. We have become a bit disconnected because of the IT use, but we can still stay connected. We've got to create and maintain trusting relationships with other people at work and in our personal lives. So people like consultants like me, sole practitioners or people who choose to work from home, they can isolate themselves more than others than if you go into an office. But even in an office, you can feel isolated. Even in the busiest room, you can feel isolated if you don't take care. But sole practitioners and consultants needn't feel alone in their space. They could share office space. They can join groups and clubs with other sole practitioners and consultants. So there's ways and means of getting that face-to-face -face communication going again. I'd get to know your colleagues. Um, identify the allies. I'll say allies because Tone is going to start laughing now, but that you have to have allies who know what you're talking about. Litigators need lit litigious allies. We need to be able to know that if we say central London, county courts, done it again, the person who's listening to you knows exactly what you mean. Um, and it's great because allies always understand when you just have to say central London, county court, and it's a connection. Those words are just a connection. You discuss your frustrations, you discuss your struggles. It's not a problem shared, it's a problem squared. It really is dissipated it's I kind of resolved it virtual coffee mornings are a must right now we, we, we all know how to do it now you've got to continue doing it and if you're in the office just grab somebody for a cup of coffee or even go out for lunch get that break time in and as lawyers we've got plenty of law related resources law care are brilliant we've got bar association groups we've got lawyer assistance programs You've got to practice this self-care. You've got to go out and do it yourselves. No one's going to come, come on, let's do some self-care. You've got to do it yourself. So there's a great deal of, you've got to put yourself out there in order to get some something back. Don't wait for the phone to ring. Ring somebody else's phone. And if we're all doing that, the chances are someone's going to phone you. But in the meantime, you're phoning others. You've also got to create and maintain boundaries, for goodness sake. If you're going to finish work at five, finish work at five. Like right now, I'm going to be leaving here at 20 past one. Nothing's going to stop me because I have my daughter to rescue. Um, but you've got to maintain those boundaries. Um, look after yourself. You've, you've put a boundary in place for yourself. Stick to it. Honour yourself. And for goodness sake, keep work in perspective always. There is much more to life than that paycheck. And there really is much more to life. So looking at it, we all know that it's our work colleagues and peers who probably understand us best, who are going to have the same sort of experiences um, so that they will understand. We say, oh, my goodness, you know, someone's just done something in a directions hearing. It's great. We need our work colleagues. They've been there themselves. So a healthy work related social life is a must. But you need to balance that out with a healthy work, a healthy social life at home. And loved ones are essential to create that balance. They do non-work related activities with us. Now they might not understand a single word about what we do in our business lives. My husband tries, bless him, but I wouldn't expect him to understand what I do. Um, and I wouldn't expect anybody's other half, unless they're a lawyer, to understand us. You know, lawyers are strange animals. Um, and we've got to be accepting of that, you know, we are strange people um, and we do have very different views and very coloured views because of what we have to put up with and the, the rules and regulations that we know we can't get over. They're a real pain in the neck, but we know them, but other people just don't. And, and it's tricky. 
but you've got to have a balance between your work social and your personal social. Now, this is where I'm going to start causing issues because although I've just said balance, I don't like to use the words work life balance because that tends to suggest that you're taking from one to give to the other. I've always said in my life coaching, it's a work life integration because invariably at some point your workload is going to be heavier than your social load, but it can tip. But it's not a question of taking from one to give to the other to keep a balance. It's a question of integrating them. So actually it's a seamless tackling of both so that when you have a high workload, yes, of course your social life's gonna fall away slightly, but there's gonna be a pickup time. And I think you've just got to learn to cope with the ebbs and flows of both. And actually then you will get a seamless integration. So I think a work-life integration is possibly a better way to aim for things rather than a balancing act. Now, my, in, my, in my talk last time, it was, you know, what can employers do? Because we had obviously the bosses on the line. But actually, what I'm about to say doesn't just apply to employers. It, imply, in, it applies to all of us in the work situation. You know, for employers all the way down to people who were supervising you, but to anybody really. Just check in regularly with people. Ask them what they're doing at home. Ask them if they're coping with their workload. Ask them if they understand what they've been asked to do. These are really simple questions. But they start conversations and make sure that people aren't sitting there going, I haven't got a clue how to do this. You know, I've just been asked to prepare a bundle for directions here and I don't know what to go in it. Just somebody asking you that simple question will let you just go, I haven't got a clue, I don't know what I'm doing. Ah. It helps, it starts a conversation, it will get you the answers. And similarly ask them what they're doing at home. You know, bringing that connection into work, I don't agree you should leave home at the door. Of course you bring it into work. And why shouldn't you? Because people want to get to know you, the authentic you, and a, an awful lot of that is what you're like at home. So I think that leaving it at, the, at home, leaving it at the door, is an archaic principle in my view some people still do it i don't tell everybody what happens at home obviously but people know me you can probably tell i tell people a lot of things i like people to get to know me my clients know me and i think that's a good way to sort of get across to clients you know you're authentic they like the authentic pay attention to vulnerable groups um i don't mean vulnerable as an ill i mean vulnerable as in newcomers newcomers to a firm juniors to a firm, somebody who doesn't have any experience on how to deal with how a law firm works um, and how this particular law firm works. I've recently joined Saracens, actually that was about a year ago with Sonne. Um, but when I was a newbie, I needed to be told how they did things. Because you don't come in as a newbie and start going, oh no, I don't do things like that. It doesn't work like that. So you've also got to check in with your newbies and your juniors and make sure they understand the processes in the firm and build a culture of connection and community it's all very well saying these things but actually you need to build a community that is willing to communicate and act as a community so tea breaks um weekly catch-ups team days peer support all these things help um and it's essential that they're set up properly regularly so that people know that there is a day in a month or a day in a week that they can have a chat with somebody it's something for them to look forward to it's a goal post something that they can gather their thoughts for and also encourage people back to the workplace yes we've got used to zoom yes we've got used to teams but as i said at the beginning we need that face-to-face -face connection and i think just by getting people to come back into the workplace just just to meet people is great um, you need to also ensure that that work-life integration is taking place. So if people are constantly in the office, there's something wrong. They need to be taking their breaks. They need to be taking their full lunch hours. They need to be taking their holidays. Um, they need to be getting some rest. Don't work weekends unless you really have to. Um, I used to, and it's counterproductive because you never, ever leave work where it should be. And sometimes it should be on your laptop, not constantly in your face. So I'm going to round up really briefly. So my little buzz phrase, please remember it. Stay connected in a disconnected world. Get yourself out there. Call someone for coffee. Nudge somebody for lunch. 
ask someone a question. I said in my last week, it was a stupid question. Actually, no, it's not a stupid question. If you want to ask it, ask it, because the chances are, if you think it's stupid, somebody else thinks it's stupid. It's never been asked, so nobody's got the answer. And actually, the stupid questions are the ones that probably get you the best answers ever. Tell people something that, that's really daft that's happened in one of your cases. And yeah, I am going to tell them about the tortoise. So I was on a directions hearing with a judge, my opponent, and all of a sudden there was this almighty crash. My tortoise, not a dog, not a cat, a tortoise, decided to throw himself out of his cage, lying there pathetically on his back, wheeling his legs in the air. So I burst out laughing on a video call with the judge. And the judge was kind of, would you like to tell us what's going on? And I went, not really. He went, I'd like to know what's going on. So of course, by the end of my little telling of the tale, the judge was laughing, the opponent was laughing. It totally diffused what was actually quite a heated directions debate, but it's made everybody else smile since. Um, and I think even partly the other day was, well, did the tortoise survive? Well, yeah, he did, he's fine, he's down here now. Um, but it was fun and it was just sharing that, you know, people found out a little bit about me, about the fact that I've got a tortoise. And it's just, it's a conversation. Get the conversations going. Don't sit there on your own. If you want to chat, just put an email out, phone somebody, do it. Just get the conversations going. That's me done. Thank you, Susie. There was, I suppose, a lot of takeaways for me anyway from that. And I'm sure everyone will agree as well. So really interesting. Um, and I've heard that sort of story quite a few times, but it makes me laugh every time. So thank you for sharing. Um, no well, problem. We'll We'll leave you to go and rescue your daughter. Thank you. <laughs> but thank you for joining us anyway. All right, good luck. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> thank you. All right, bye. Bye. So um, now we're going to sort of go into breakout sessions. So you can all have a chat amongst yourselves about loneliness um, and tips that you've found to help as well. So pop the... Okay. So... Um, from my experience, I've had, I've experienced two different types of loneliness. The first one being the common one, being physically isolated, which is what people tend to think of when um, they talk about loneliness. So for me, that happened across the various lockdowns during the pandemic. My first one was in May 2020, when I was put on furlough for almost three months. And the second one was in December 2020, when Boris Johnson took my Christmas plans away from me when we all went into tier four. So in that first instance was when I actually discovered Surrey JLD. I'd heard of the JLD before, but hadn't had much interaction. And I certainly hadn't heard of the local JLDs, but I was distraught at being on furlough less than a year into my training contract and had no other junior lawyers to confide in. So I came across a post that our now chair Martin, who's on the event today, put up on the Surrey JLD LinkedIn page about Coco with the committee, which was a fortnightly session on a Wednesday evening when junior lawyers would get together to chat about various fun legal stories. I still to this day, and I probably always will remember the conversations that we had during that time. There were the new build properties with excellent light because they had no roof. Um, debating whether Jaffa cakes are in fact biscuits or cakes. And of course, Tiger Law, the US law firm with a pretty impressive Instagram page. All of that really did keep me going. And then from there, I found other events aimed at junior lawyers. There were the sessions set up by Hannah Becco for junior lawyers who had been put on furlough. I then progressed from there to her coffee and coaching sessions, which are still ongoing to this day. What I learned when you're physically isolated like that is to reach out to like-minded individuals, look up events, um, especially in times of lockdown virtual events that relate to your interests. Also just contacting other people via phone or Zoom. And then we had the December 2020 experience of loneliness. So I'd actually become burned out at work. I'd come back to work after almost three months on furlough desperate to prove myself and I got myself really exhausted thinking well I'll just relax at Christmas and then there was that dreaded announcement putting us all into tier four and I literally was in tears knowing I'd be stuck at home not being able to do anything or see anyone 
And that's when I started my thousand piece puzzle of Monet's Water Lilies. So I love art and haven't done a puzzle since I was a child. So that really did keep me occupied, especially a thousand pieces. Um, and it's still not finished. So hopefully I'll be able to finish it soon. So moral of the story is pursuing your interests, especially creative ones, are excellent at coping with loneliness. Now, the second type of loneliness that I've experienced is not when you're physically isolated, but when you don't quite fit in. So at school, I had friends, but not close friends. I always felt that I was tagging along with a group. Then at university, I seemed to develop a group of friends. But in recent years, I realised that, again, they weren't really good friends, apart from a couple that I'm still in touch with. It's taken until very recently for me to realise that it's actually because I'm neurodivergent. I'm currently being assessed for ADHD and autism spectrum disorder. So of course I wouldn't have fit in with neurotypicals, but as it was undiagnosed, I didn't quite know what was going on. And of course, society tells you that you should have a massive group of friends. So not having that made me feel like a bit of a loner. Now, two points on that. One is that really finding a group of like-minded individuals, so like the junior lawyers division or other people that you really get along with um, based on your interests is much better than having a massive group of friends that you don't fully get on with. The people I've met through Surrey JLG, um, all the mental health awareness and wellbeing stuff I do, and of course the brilliant neurodiversity and law, with them I felt way more connected than anyone that I met at school and university. So find like-minded individuals and that will really help combat loneliness. My second point on that is quality over quantity. So yes, society might say people with the biggest group of friends are doing better, but is that really something that works for you? For me, I realized that having a couple of friends that I speak to regularly, as well as my network that I've developed amongst junior lawyers, mental health advocates, and those in neurodiversity is much better than having a massive group of friends that I don't really get along with. So to sum up, you might be physically isolated, you might be mentally isolated. The main thing is to figure out what you want or what works for you and also what your interests are and connect with people as best you can. So if you can't connect with them physically, connect with them virtually with Zoom or phone calls and pursue your interests. Those are my main tips for combating loneliness. Thank you all for listening. And I think we've got a bit of time for just a general chat or some questions. So I will stop the recording and um, everyone can just